Why does this monster have a baby's face? The story begins on a stormy night. The farmer's cow is having a difficult birth in the middle of the night. The only veterinarian in town comes to assist with the delivery. She pulls out a bloody and malformed infant. Everyone is shocked to see that it's a human baby. No one dares to say a word. Pedrosa is a small border town in Spain. They have never encountered such a strange occurrence in hundreds of years. They seek the help of the mayor. The mayor warns everyone to put away their phones. He advises them to keep this matter discreet. The birth of a human baby from a cow is beyond comprehension. The mayor decides to seek help from the priest. A group of people heads to the church. The town's priest, Father Kyle, is somewhat unconventional. He is not only a priest but also a renowned boxer. It's unclear what mistake he made, which led to his assignment to this place by the Vatican. The group opens a video recorded by a villager to investigate. Kyle realizes that the villagers conspired to deceive Mary. They took advantage of the veterinarian's distraction. They switched the calf with the baby. Perhaps someone in the village didn't want the baby. That's why they came up with this idea. The three of them went to a cafe to discuss this matter. The mayor's wife, Ellie, was somewhat reluctant. There were a lot of issues in the factory that needed to be addressed. The mayor didn't have time for such matters. The couple managed the hotel and slaughterhouse in town. They were neither short of money nor lacking in reputation. The mayor wasn't arrogant and was friendly with others. Ellie took care of the household matters. The mayor's current status was all thanks to his wife's help. He entrusted Ellie with handling this matter. They continued to investigate the baby's situation with Mary. The three of them found out. The farmer's daughter hadn't been to school for a week. She was with her boyfriend all the time before she disappeared. They thought that this child might be hers. They drove to Hank's house. The mayor asked if his daughter was pregnant. Hank was about to kick them out upon hearing that. He insisted that his daughter couldn't be slandered, as she wasn't married. Hank told Mary to take care of herself. The situation was about to get out of control. His daughter's amniotic fluid spilled on the ground. Although his daughter was indeed pregnant, it also meant she wasn't the baby's mother. Mary and the mayor carefully examined the footage. They discover that the person closest to the cow was a well-known beggar in town. This person is an intellectually impaired orphan. On the other hand, Kyle has just returned to the church. He sees the beggar rummaging his house. The beggar shows no fear. He leads Kyle to a corner of the church. He removes the decorations on the wall. Surprisingly, it reveals a hidden room. The beggar says it was built by a former priest to escape the abuse of the militia. Kyle asks the beggar to keep it a secret. He tells him not to reveal the existence of the secret room to anyone. Unexpectedly, an accident occurs that same evening. The bell tower in the small town was knocked by someone. The awakened residents gather in the square. The beggar has stolen the baby. He carries the baby to the top of the bell tower. Everyone believes the beggar has intellectual issues, but this young man is actually a chosen one. He can communicate with spirits and perceive divine secrets. However, no one believes the words of a fool. The beggar holds the baby with one hand. He claims that the baby is a curse and must die. Otherwise, demons will descend upon everyone. Kyle and the old police officer in town are very nervous. They want to persuade the beggar to hand over the baby. However, they are not skilled in negotiations. In the end, Mary convinced the beggar, but the beggar couldn't kill the baby, as he couldn't explain it to the gods. He told Kyle, I'm doing all of this for you. After saying that, he jumped off the bell tower. Luckily, he survived. The police handed the baby over to the owner of the cattle farm for care. The mayor and Mary found two things beside the beggar. Most likely, the beggar had stolen them from Kyle. These two things were a Catholic exorcism book. The other was a silver coin and an iron nail in a metal box. They didn't return them to their rightful owner. Instead, they secretly kept them. As for the origin of this silver coin, it is related to the main theme of this film. In a biblical story, Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. This led to Jesus being crucified. Judas felt guilty and chose to end his own life. His 30 pieces of silver were taken by others. They scattered to different parts of the world. Presumably, this coin is one of them. The mayor took the exorcism book home. He searched online for Kyle's background. He learned that Kyle had been accused of murder. He had spent two years in prison before coming to the town. Ellie warns her husband to be careful of Kyle. He surely wants to cause trouble in the town, and then present himself as an exorcist. This way, he can prove his abilities and return to the Vatican. Mary has also found out about Kyle's history, but she doesn't beat around the bush. Instead, she goes straight to the church to find Kyle. Smart people have straightforward conversations. Kyle honestly confesses the details of the murder accusation. At that time, he was helping a possessed boy to be exorcised, but that demon was unusually resilient. Holy water and crosses were ineffective. Kyle tried various methods, but nothing worked. He accidentally caused the boy to have a fatal heart attack. The iron nail and silver coin in the metal box were taken out from the boy's body during the exorcism. Kyle's life took a downturn because of this incident. After serving a two-year sentence, he came here. 
Mary, upon hearing this, returns the metal box she was holding. Kyle doesn't take it. Mary puts the coin in her pocket. Just then, the mayor and the police officer come to arrest Kyle. He believes his wife's words have merit. She suspects Kyle is the one behind all the mischief. Kyle states that he has no involvement in the matter. If they don't believe him, they can investigate. Meanwhile, the veterinarian goes to inspect the cattle farm. After the incident with the baby's birth, surprisingly, the cow has no issues. The cattle farm owner tells the veterinarian that he and his wife had a son. Due to a momentary negligence, their son drowned. The death of their son brought eternal sadness to their family. Until the mother cow gave birth to a baby, the cattle farm owner believed it was God's will. That's why they applied to adopt this child. But now things have spiraled out of control. Mary finds it strange upon hearing this. The cattle farm owner remains silent. He takes Mary to the second floor room. The room is arranged as a nursery. Within a few days, the baby has transformed into a monstrous headed infant. Jane lovingly holds the baby to others. This scene is like a horror movie. Mary says goodbye to the couple and goes to find the mayor. Shortly after she leaves, the cattle farm owner starts arguing with his wife. He doesn't want to raise this monster anymore. He is ready to go to the police station to report it. However, his wife is overwhelmed by maternal love. She doesn't allow anyone to harm the child. After killing her husband, Jane, goes to the kitchen to prepare fresh liver as baby food, because the monstrous baby only eats raw food. Meanwhile, the mayor sneaks out of the house while his wife is asleep. As soon as he leaves, Ellie opens her eyes. The mayor and Mary arrive at the cattle farm owner's house. The room is filled with ropes in spider web patterns. The cattle farm owner's body is hanging upside down from the ceiling. It looks like food stored by a spider. They muster their courage and go upstairs to question Jane. <laughs> Jane is like a warrior. Mary sees the mayor being brutally beaten. She runs back to the car and escapes. She plans to seek help. Coincidentally, she encounters Kyle and the police officer. It turns out the mayor had contacted them beforehand. The three of them return to the cattle farm owner's house. Jane ties the mayor to the ceiling. She has been possessed by a demon and has formidable fighting abilities. Jane's purpose for existing is to protect the malformed fetus upstairs. She asked Kyle to hand over the silver coin. Otherwise, this matter won't end. Jane severely beats Kyle, the old police officer fires multiple shots, and knocks her down. Afterwards, Ellie calls an ambulance to take away her husband. Jane is also placed inside the ambulance. Mary returns to the second floor nursery. The monstrous headed baby, has already jumped out the window and escaped. There are still traces of its shed skin on the floor. No one knows what the baby has transformed into. At that moment, Jane in the ambulance suddenly sits up. She holds a spider doll in her hand, and summons her son. The monster breaks open the ambulance door and saves Jane. Kyle seems to know that the monster won't leave easily. He takes Mary into a secret room in the church. He opens his arsenal of weapons. The next moment, sounds of broken windows come from the sacristy. Kyle goes to check the situation. It turns out Jane is chasing after them. Get off. In a critical moment, Mary comes out to attract attention. She takes refuge in the prayer room. Just then, the mayor happens to call, but before the veterinarian can answer, Jane arrives outside the door. She sees the silver coin in the veterinarian's hand. She immediately smashes the wooden door and reaches out to grab it. Kyle unleashes his strength and knocks Jane down. He blesses the bullets in holy water. Then he shoots at Jane. Kyle carries her to the backyard to deal with her. Meanwhile, there are banging sounds coming from above the prayer room. The spider-like monster baby finally appears. Mary covers her mouth, and doesn't dare to make a sound. She sees that the spider-like monster has a baby's face. Mary quickly answers the phone. The mayor knows that the monster listens to the doll's summons. He tells her to destroy the doll quickly. Mary runs out of the prayer room. The monster also chases after her. The eerie baby face gets closer and closer. The monster dives into the well to escape. Then Kyle appears. Mary asks him why he killed Jane. Of course, it was to save his own life. Kyle didn't kill her. Jane is lying in the sacristy right now. Kyle asks Mary to return the silver coin. However, Mary refuses. Meanwhile, something strange happens in Switzerland. An old man rushes into a bank and heads straight for the vault. Even bullets can't bring him down. The old man has a clear goal. He takes the silver coins from the vault. Then he walks to a black car on the street. 
he hands the silver coins to the priest wearing sunglasses in the car. The next moment, he takes his last breath, and the boss of the sunglasses wearing priest, is a cardinal from the Vatican. They are secretly collecting 30 silver coins. The scene shifts back to Mary. She holds the silver coins and tells the mayor, the monster came for this thing. Father Kyle is hiding something from us. That evening, the tavern owner's son, snuck a bottle of alcohol from the shop, and went to party with friends. They ran to the desolate wilderness to play a spirit summoning game. The ponytail girl's mother died just three months ago. They wanted to summon her mother's spirit. However, the Ouija board attracted a ghost from another place. He claimed to be from Italy. His name was Shia Como. Just then, a gust of wind blew out the candle. The friends turned on their flashlights. They were shocked to find that ponytail girl, Lily, was missing. That night, the police and concerned villagers all dispatched. Unfortunately, they searched all night but found no trace. At that moment, the wealthiest man in town arrived with Mary. The two of them were in a romantic relationship. They had been going on frequent dates recently. Lily's father was the wealthy man's bodyguard. That's why he came to inquire about the progress of the search. The mayor saw Mary with the wealthy man and felt a bit jealous. He had long been attracted to Mary. Since the police didn't find any clues, Mary went to visit Lily's close friend, the girl with short hair. She wants to know what exactly happened last night. The girl with short hair said that an Italian ghost kidnapped Lily. His name is Shia Como. Mary's face changed upon hearing this, because the boy who was killed by Kyle's exorcism was named Shia Como. Mary immediately went to the church to question Kyle. Kyle explained that he had nothing to do with Lily's disappearance. As for the rest, he had nothing to disclose. Late at night, the young people discussed Lily's disappearance in a group chat. They were chatting lively. Lily's account suddenly came online, and she even called the girl with blonde hair. The blonde girl answered the call nervously. Lily shouted on the phone. You have to summon the spirit board again, to save me from here. The girl with short hair learned that everyone was going to play the spirit summoning game again. She immediately went to Mary for help. The female lead was worried that the children would get into trouble. She could only accompany the girl with short hair to the designated location. When the two arrived at the scene, the game hadn't started yet. Unexpectedly, the cups on the table started moving. Everyone forced themselves to remain calm and started the game, and they actually summoned Lily. She also expressed her desire to talk to Mary. At the moment the veterinarian touched the cup, the glass started moving faster, and it spelled out a complete sentence. Give us back the silver coins. The next moment, the basement lights went out, before everyone could react. The missing girl, Lily, appeared. The next day, the girl went to the church to find Kyle. She said those people asked me to tell you, give back their things. Kyle didn't say much, he sent Lily out of the church. Her father took her away, just as they passed an old man with a hat. Lily suddenly told the old man, sorry, but you're going to die tonight. The old man was terrified upon hearing this. He felt a sharp pain in his heart, as expected, before nightfall. The old man with the hat died from a heart attack. After hearing about this incident, the girl with short hair decided to talk to her good friend. It turns out that since Lily came back, she could see everyone surrounded by different colors. Once the surrounding color approached black, it meant that person was about to die. To verify her claim, Lily pointed at a passerby holding flowers and said that person would die soon. The girl with short hair found this matter too suspicious, so she asked for Mary's help. Mary thought predicting death was absurd. So she grabbed the girl with short hair who was about to warn the passerby. Before the two could leave, the man holding the flowers was hit by a car and died. The mayor rushed to the scene upon hearing the news. Mary wanted to explain the situation to him. However, Ellie stopped the mayor from getting further involved in these matters. It wouldn't be beneficial for the mayoral campaign. But the mayor didn't take his wife's words to heart. His attention was focused entirely on Mary. In the afternoon, the mayor, Kyle, and Mary, prepared to talk to Lily. Unexpectedly, the girl almost attempted suicide. Luckily, they noticed in time. As soon as Lily opened her eyes, she told Kyle, your color is also turning black. Kyle didn't believe in all this. The so-called prediction of death is just a psychological suggestion by demons, causing them to become nervous and distracted, leading to accidents. In the evening, Kyle was resting at home. Suddenly, the TV in his house turned on. ¿De qué anoche? No nos devuelves. La moneda. Destruiremos. Ese pueblo y a las personas. ¿Qué más quieres? At that moment, the doorbell rang suddenly. Kyle opened the door and was surprised to see Lily. He invited the girl into the house and went to the kitchen to pour water. Lily picked up a fruit knife and turned around. It was unclear what she was cutting. She handed Kyle a piece of cloth. Kyle opened it and looked inside. To his surprise, it was Lily's severed finger. The girl threatened expressionlessly. If you don't give them what they want, I will continue to cut off my fingers, ears, and tongue. Kyle grabbed the knife and threw it away. 
Then he walked to the door to call the police. Unexpectedly, Lily picked up the knife and chased after him. She directly cut her own mouth. Kyle had no choice but to take Lily to Mary's house to search for the silver coin. To their surprise, they couldn't find the item. The wealthy man and Mary returned. They saw Lily covered in blood. They thought Kyle was responsible. The wealthy man was about to catch him and interrogate him. However, Lily stabbed him from behind with a dagger. She demanded that Mary immediately hand over the silver coin. At that moment, the wealthy man on the ground knocked over a lamp. In the light of the lamp, the shadows of five disciples appeared on the wall. They must have been controlling the girl. Kyle tried to awaken Lily, yet, she had already been brainwashed by a mysterious force, and she firmly believed that as long as she obediently listened, she could bring her mother back to life. She summoned a hurricane that flipped the roof. Everyone held onto the furniture tightly, afraid to let go. The injured wealthy man was lifted into the air by the storm. Kyle urged Lily not to believe the lies. Your mother definitely wouldn't want to see this scene. In a critical moment, Lily regained her senses. Both she and the wealthy man were taken to the hospital. Meanwhile, in the neighboring room, the little beggar who was recuperating, was talking to the dark shadow on the wall. He assured the bishop, I will take care of him. I'll be waiting for your arrival. Meanwhile, in New York, USA, a bald man carrying a box, entered a jewelry store on the street. He told the store clerk, you know what I want. Upon hearing this, the store clerk opened the safe in the storage room. He took out a necklace with silver coins embedded in it. After the bald man picked out the silver coins, he killed the store clerk and left. The scene then shifts back to the small town in Spain. The mayor had just officiated a wedding for a couple. He was absent-minded throughout the whole ceremony. Ellie was very dissatisfied with this, because she wanted to promote her hotel through this wedding. At this moment, the bride's bald cousin was on his way to the hotel. He had a three-tiered cake placed on the back seat. It was custom-made from a nearby town. During the journey, the cousin and his wife had an anxious conversation. They discussed the strange things they saw at home last night. They hoped that thing would disappear soon. The cousin got distracted and crashed into a roadside pole. His wife heard the commotion on the phone and quickly called the police. An ambulance took the bald cousin to the hospital. The cousin's wife didn't want to hide the truth anymore. She hoped the mayor would come to their house and investigate. So the two of them returned to the cousin's house. The cousin's wife led the mayor to a mirror. Then Mary received a phone call. The mayor asked her to come over immediately. Just then, the pet dog at the clinic kept barking incessantly. It desperately pulled off the backpack from the table. It seemed to be looking for the silver coins inside. Mary saw that the pet dog couldn't calm down. She had no choice but to put it back in the cage. Then she went to the bald cousin's house. Mary looked at the mirror for a long time but couldn't find any issue. The mayor pointed out that there was a book on the table in the mirror. But there was no book on the table in the real world. Mary looked at the mirror. That's true. She used the zoom mode on her phone to look at the book's spine. She discovered that the book was titled, The Gospel of Judas. The Gospel of Judas is a religious book from a paganism in Christianity. It records the truth of Jesus orchestrating Judas' betrayal. Since the mayor had limited knowledge about religion, he sought the help of Father Kyle. The latter told the mayor, the Cainites believe that betrayal is a form of redemption, because God is an all-powerful being. Everything in the world is part of his plan. God wanted Judas to betray him, because only through that could redemption be achieved. Therefore, Judas is considered the greatest saint. He sacrificed his own soul to fulfill Christ's mission. Kyle asked the mayor in return, Have you ever wondered why God allows evil to exist? The Cainites believe that evil is a necessary condition for good to exist. Evil people are also playing roles arranged by God. So, in a sense, evil is good. Evil is also part of God's plan. Then the three main characters gathered in front of the mirror at the cousin's house. The mayor noticed that the door in the mirror was open, while the door in reality remained closed. No matter how they shook the real door, it had no effect on the world inside the mirror. Just then, Mary saw a person in black walk into the door in the mirror. The three immediately checked the room behind the real door, but there was no one inside. The mayor, in search of the truth, bought several mini cameras from a photographer and installed them near the mirror to monitor the situation. Meanwhile, Kyle stayed behind to guard the eerie mirror. After the mayor left, he showed Mary the surveillance footage, saying they could take this opportunity to confirm whether Kyle was good or evil. Mary felt that it was inappropriate to do so. The mayor, however, thought it was a good idea. That night, he hid in the bathroom and kept watching the surveillance. Ellie found it strange why her husband had been in the bathroom for over an hour. While Mary disagreed with the mayor's actions verbally, she couldn't resist and opened the surveillance system at home. As time passed by, Kyle sitting in front of the mirror started to doze off. Just then, the person in the mirror suddenly stood up. He gazed eerily at the real Kyle. The pet dogs in the town suddenly started barking together. The next morning, the mayor and Mary returned to their cousin's house. They woke up Kyle, who was sleeping on the table. 
they asked him to take a look at the footage from last night. Kyle was greatly shocked after seeing it. He saw the Kyle in the mirror walking into the open door. Inside, there was a shirtless man sitting, although real-life Kyle was surprised. He was unhappy that the two of them had secretly been monitoring him. Therefore, he refused to talk to them. However, Mary guessed that the shirtless person in the mirror was Shia Como. That mirror could reflect people's inner fears. Kyle was avoiding facing his past, which is why he ignored this matter. Later, Mary went to visit her bald cousin, and she learned from his wife's words that although the book was not on the table in reality, as long as one touched the tabletop, they could feel the outline of the book. Could it be that the world they were in was an illusion? Mary immediately went to find the mayor. They were about to return to their cousin's house, but they noticed that the curtains had been pulled closed. They hurriedly rushed to that room, only to find Kyle preparing to smash the mirror. The two quickly stopped Kyle. Just then, the Kyle in the mirror appeared. He said he wanted to have a private conversation with real-life Kyle. The mayor and Mary had no choice but to leave temporarily. The Kyle in the mirror expressed that they had not given up on him as long as he was willing to hand over the silver coin. Upon hearing this, Kyle unplugged the camera in the room. He then raised a hammer, preparing to take action. Unexpectedly, the person in the mirror suddenly spoke up, saying that Shiakomo wanted to have a conversation with him. After saying that, he pushed the boy out. Shiakomo was surrounded by flies, and had a pale face. Kyle wanted to seek his forgiveness, but unexpectedly, Shiakomo suddenly stood up. He embraced Kyle, and dragged him into the mirror. Meanwhile, the fake Kyle walked out of the mirror world, when the mayor and Mary broke into the room. They had no idea that the person in front of them had been switched. The fake Kyle led the mayor and Mary back to the church. He told them that the person who wanted to take the silver coin, was a member of the Canaanite sect. Their sacred objects were items that had harmed Jesus, such as the nails of the cross and the crown of thorns, or the spear of Longinus. These were items related to the suffering of God, and they were the source of their power. Therefore, they strongly believed that gathering the 30 pieces of silver from Judas would lead to the destruction of Christianity. The fake Kyle told Mary that she was not capable of protecting the silver coin, and it would be best to hand it over to him for safekeeping. Mary thought that the fake Kyle was right, but she wanted to personally return the silver coin to the sacristy of the church. Mary and the mayor went to the veterinary hospital to retrieve the silver coin. However, they noticed that the fake Kyle was behaving strangely. They quickly locked the doors and windows of the clinic. But the fake Kyle kept brainwashing Mary, trying to persuade her to hand over the silver coin. Just as Mary was about to be convinced by him, she suddenly noticed something unusual about the fake Kyle's watch. The next moment, Mary pushed him down, and locked the doors of the veterinary hospital again. The fake Kyle on the street had already disappeared. The two of them realized that there was something wrong with the priest. So they called the police for help, but the fake Kyle hypnotized the police officer with mysterious powers. Then he disrupted the entire town's residence, making everyone gather at the church. The fake Kyle stood on the stage and gave a speech, intentionally fueling hatred towards the mayor and Mary. On the other side, a crazed pet dog escaped from its cage. It stared intensely at Mary, who was holding the silver coin. Seeing this, the mayor told Mary to throw the silver coin over. As expected, the pet dog turned and lunged at the mayor. In a critical moment, Mary pulled out a tranquilizer and injected it into the pet dog. The two of them realized that Kyle had been switched, so they went to Bald Cousin's house. They searched for a way to enter the mirror world. Mary didn't forget Bald Cousin's wife's words. She tentatively felt around the tabletop. Sure enough, she felt the outline of a book, and the mirror showed her holding the book. Mary forcefully smashed the book against the mirror. The mirror shattered with a sound. The passage to the mirror world was revealed. The two of them stepped into the mysterious realm. They entered the open door. They arrived in an extremely luxurious room. They noticed mirrors covering the walls on both sides. Each mirror led to a different location. At that moment, Mary was drawn to a particular mirror. Inside, she saw a group of cardinals. Kyle was forcibly tied to a long table. A white-clad disciple was about to execute him. At a critical moment, Mary revealed the silver coin. Kyle took the opportunity to break free from his restraints. He stomped on the table and rushed forward. Smashing the mirror, the mayor carried him out of the mirror world. Meanwhile, the fake Kyle led the townspeople to the front of the pet clinic. They rushed over and pushed open the door. They started rummaging through everything, searching for the silver coin, but they couldn't find anything. Leader Ellie came out to report the situation. The fake Kyle touched her cheek upon hearing her words, then he disappeared. Meanwhile, the mayor and Mary took Kyle to the hospital. The mayor suddenly received a call from his wife. Both of them concealed the events of tonight, and they agreed to meet later at home. Meanwhile, the pagans outside the town are busy collecting silver coins. A group of people wearing work uniforms is moving forward in a subway tunnel. They open a side door of the tunnel and arrive at a circular tunnel. They each crawl inside. To their surprise, inside is another scene. 
An inverted statue of Jesus on the cross stands in the center. The leading priest climbs up by using a ladder, and pries out a silver coin from Jesus' eye. Back in the town, because the residents destroyed the veterinarian's clinic, the mayor proposes that everyone donate according to their ability, to help Mary rebuild the clinic. Yet, the residents think the veterinary clinic is a minor issue, and they want to know why they are losing control. Lately, strange things have been happening in the town, with consecutive deaths. Everyone can no longer pretend to turn a blind eye. Ah, es el culpable. Desde que vino a este pueblo, pasa esto. Ellie inflames passions further by mentioning Kyle's time in prison. She wants everyone to sign a petition demanding the replacement of the priest. The residents nod, and agree with Ellie's statement. The mayor has no choice but to agree. However, his conflict with his wife grows deeper. The mayor feels that the petition cannot be kept a secret from Kyle. He wants to give him a heads up in advance. To his surprise, there is no one at Kyle's home. At this moment, he is on a plane heading to Rome. Kyle is ready to seek the help of his friend. Rome in 1990. He often meets up with his friends, Paolo and Fov. During their conversations, the three of them talked about the reasons why they wanted to become priests. Fov expresses his desire to find God perhaps by capturing demons. He can catch God's attention, to prove their courage in facing fear. The three of them start playing the knife game. Kyle and Paolo are afraid of injuring their fingers, but Fog firmly grips the fork, and stabs it into his hand without flinching. He doesn't even frown. When Kyle wakes up, he is already in Rome. He takes a taxi to a religious institution. The place is under renovation, and not open to the public. Kyle ignores the signs, and enters the building. The scenes of studying here in the past are unforgettable. In 1990, a teacher performed an exorcism in the classroom. He said it didn't matter what the demon said. What the exorcist needed to do was to pray steadfastly. In qualche modo il diavolo si comunica con noi attraverso imparare da lui, ottenere il massimo delle informazioni. Chi crede di essere? No, pensa di poter parlare con lui e uscirne indenne? Non impiegherebbe che pochi secondi ad impossessarsi di lei. Lo capisce? Esca dall'aula, signor Vergara. Esca. After class, Fov and Paolo call out to Kyle. They arrange to meet at the warehouse at 10 p.m. Fov has something to share with the two of them. In the evening, the three of them walk into container number 188. Inside, a man in a suit is locked up. He has been kept here for two months. Fov claims that this man is a demon. Talking to him a few times is more effective than attending classes. To prove his words are not false, he tears off the tape from the demon's mouth. The demon immediately reveals Kyle's childhood experiences and they are extremely private matters, that no one else knows except Kyle. Paolo suspects that he is a fraud. Fov questions the demon. Do you have any more of your kind? Where are the other demons? Are you beyond this perceivable world? Or do demons live in everyone's mind? The demon answers. After the initial battle, Satan took his subordinates, and withdrew to a place where God cannot see. This place is called, intelligence, also known as hell. Fov asks again, what is the purpose of the holy war? The demon answers, we just hope, that the roles we play in the divine plan are acknowledged. Although demons are assigned undesirable roles, without them, God's drama would be incomplete. Should actors playing evil roles, be denied recognition? Io non voglio riconoscere che il male fa parte di lui, è questo che intendi. Bingo. Fov is fascinated by the demon's perspective. He even wants to meet Satan, the demon's leader. The demon warns Fov. Satan's mere existence can destroy humanity. However, Fov is willing to take this risk. Kyle is not brainwashed by the demon's words. This statement is very powerful. We are not assigned roles by God. So we have the right to choose between good and evil. Fov walks alone into the glowing gate. The two friends make completely different choices. When Kyle hears his screams, he quickly catches up, but there is nothing behind that door. Fov disappears into thin air. Kyle takes Paolo to the hospital. The demon's flames have not only burned his flesh, but also invaded Paolo's soul. So, he wants to find a sacred place to receive baptism. Therefore, Kyle takes Paolo to Jerusalem. The two of them arrive at the Mount of Olives, as recorded in the Bible. This place is a sacred mountain for both Judaism and Christianity. Paolo devoutly recites the Bible, cleansing his soul. Surprisingly, the priest sees Fov not far away. Fov sees him and starts running. Kyle quickly follows him. He grabs Fov and asks about what happened behind the door, while Fov pretends not to recognize Kyle. Fov runs into the street, and is picked up by a mysterious person. This person is the same priest who manipulated passersby to rob a bank. Kyle arrives at the familiar reformatory. He finds Paolo, whom he hasn't seen in a long time. 
Paolo is boxing with the people from the reformatory. Kyle joins in as well. They chat while fighting. Kyle mentions that not long ago, he saw Fov in a mirror world. He was almost killed by him. It turns out that the cardinal who kidnapped Kyle before is actually Fov. Paolo expresses that this guy is now dangerous. Fov has become the Pope's chairman of the Council for Interreligious Dialogue. Paolo says that Fov won't spare Kyle. He advises Kyle to flee from Spain. It's best to escape to a place where anger and pain are even stronger. Only then can he conceal his tracks. This is also the reason why Paolo stays at the reformatory. At the same time, a father in white is being surrounded by believers as he moves forward. The demon that was locked in the warehouse years ago appears. The scene returns to the Spanish village. Although the villagers refuse to admit that they destroyed the clinic, everyone is trying to make amends in their own way. Mary has had enough of this place. Since her husband disappeared two years ago, there have been constant rumors in town. Everyone looks at her with pitiful eyes. Mary is determined to break free from this situation. So, she agrees to the wealthy man's love proposal. They plan to leave the town together. Shortly after, the mayor visits. He says he will organize a fundraiser to repair the clinic. However, Mary says there's no need to waste time. She wants to leave the town with the wealthy man. The mayor becomes very anxious upon hearing this. He doesn't want Mary to leave. But Mary is determined to go. She gets in the wealthy man's car and leaves the town. The mayor can't accept this reality. He works at the pork factory until late at night, forcing himself not to think about Mary. Ellie realizes that her husband is sulking, so she wants to have a good conversation with him, but the mayor thinks that Ellie is being pushy, which forced Mary and Kyle away. Ellie is heartbroken upon hearing this. She drives home alone. Unexpectedly, she encounters the young beggar on the way, who is in a wheelchair, as if he just escaped from the hospital. Ellie is worried about the beggar may have an accident, so she gets out of the car and pushes him towards her own inn. But then the beggar suddenly says, the whole town knows that your husband fell in love with Mary. That woman's husband is about to return. Mary and the mayor are destined to have no future together. The beggar says that this is the reward Ellie deserves. The scene shifts to Rome. Kyle finds Father Lombardi and wants to seek his help. But the priest says, you shouldn't be here. Strange things are happening in the Spanish town. Father Lombardi seems to sense something. Suddenly, he experiences a sharp pain in his head. The scene then shifts to the outskirts of the town. An old woman approaches a scarecrow with a bottle of alcohol. She puts Mary and her husband's photo inside it. She pours the alcohol around the scarecrow. This person is none other than Mary's husband, who went missing two years ago. The news quickly spreads throughout the town. The mayor rushes to the airport to intercept Mary. He informs her that her husband has returned. On the other side, Kyle walks alongside Father Lombardi. The priest instructs him to meet the Holy Father. Only this person can put an end to the matter of the 30 silver coins. Lombardi will arrange a meeting between Kyle and the Holy Father, and he warns Kyle to be careful of Fov. Kyle says goodbye to the priest and prepares to return to his lodging. He sees a demon at a restaurant by the street. He quickly quickens his pace to escape, but the demon's presence is everywhere. The next moment, Kyle wakes up from his dream. Everything that just happened feels like a dream. The next day, following Lombardi's arrangement, he goes to meet the Holy Father. This Holy Father is the same person who was intercepted by the demon earlier. Before they begin their conversation, the Holy Father asks Kyle to keep their conversation confidential, and he insists that Kyle must understand every word he says. One slip of the tongue, one misunderstanding, can lead to everything being in danger. The Holy Father instructs Kyle to report the situation to the cardinal he trusts completely. Unexpectedly, this cardinal turns out to be Fov, to interrogate the whereabouts of the coins. Cardinal Fov does not hesitate to assume the appearance of an eight-year-old child, and infiltrates Kyle's dreams to extract information. Fortunately, Paolo appears in time, and takes young Kyle away, but Fov quickly catches up. Paolo realizes his friend is in deep danger, and immediately follows the clues to find Kyle. He arrives at an exhibition held by the local church, and discovers that a priest of Canaanites who is searching for silver coins, has also brought his followers inside. They arrived behind the door that restricted outsiders from entering. Paolo had to deceive and knock out the gatekeeper, then sneaked in quietly. At that moment, two men in white suits, handed a set of clothes to Kyle inside the cell. After he put on the clothes, the two men led Kyle into the inner circle of the Canaanites. Fov wanted to pull him over to his side, as revealed in their conversation. Fov had already collected 29 silver coins, as long as he obtained the one from Mary, 
the Canites would be able to change the entire world. Just then, Kyle noticed Paolo. Fov worried that he might interfere. Consequently, he ordered his men to capture Paolo, and proceeded with Kyle to the Vatican archives. This was the largest library in the world. Fov entered through a hidden door, that housed forbidden books banned by the church, including the Gospel of Jesus. Llevo 20 años intentando asimilar lo que hay en esta sala. Ahora estoy mucho más cerca que nunca de Dios. Por el Echerly, se te unice a noi. To avoid arousing suspicion, Kyle followed the other's lead, and acted accordingly, until Fov asked Kyle to kill Paolo with his own hands, to prove his commitment to joining the Canites. Kyle reluctantly punched Paolo. Fov then reached out his hand and levitated Paolo. Kyle was astonished at the sight. Could this man truly possess divine powers? Fov didn't want to waste any more time. Kyle hurriedly escaped with Paolo. Fov immediately cast a spell on the nearby corpse. A half-human, half-spider monster caught up with Kyle and Paolo. They stumbled and ran into a door. Due to its large size, the monster got stuck outside the door. Kyle and Paolo took the opportunity to escape. Just when they thought they had escaped the danger, the monster reappeared. With Kyle on the verge of being doomed, Fov stepped forward and commanded the monster to stop, because his plan required Kyle to stay alive. Kyle picked up a dagger, wounded the monster, and slipped away. On the other side, Mary learned that her husband, Mario, was still alive, quickly followed the mayor back to confirm. Faced with the face she had longed for over the past two years, she didn't notice anything amiss. Mary immediately took her husband away from the police station, while an old woman observed them from the shadows. In fact, every move of Mario, was controlled by the old woman. The appearance of the veterinarian's husband had caused a stir in the town. When the villager, Hank, learned the news, his face revealed a shocked expression. He ran out of his house without even having lunch. Hank ran to a cafe on the street and found the veterinarian couple. He grabbed Mario's shoulder. When the man turned his head, Hank was shocked and fell to the ground. Mary wanted to approach and ask. Hank hid in the restroom of the bar and refused to show himself. The mayor came to help as soon as he heard the news. It must be said that he was indeed competent as the leader of the town. Hank, behind the restroom door, told the mayor, Mario should not have appeared, but he refused to explain the reasons. At the same time, Mary brought Mario to the burned down clinic. The mayor helped raise some funds, enough to replace the furniture and equipment. Mario believed it was unnecessary to continue running the clinic. They could move away from the town as a couple, and start anew in a different place. Meanwhile, Hank left the bar and went home to get his hunting rifle. His wife got startled when she saw this. She immediately called the mayor. Hank stormed into the veterinarian's house aggressively. Fortunately, the couple wasn't there. The old police officer also arrived at the scene in time. He shot and wounded Hank's arm. This finally calmed him down. On the other side, Mary was persuaded by Mario. Without even packing their belongings, they planned to leave. ¿Por qué te llamaron la consulta? Estaban buscando algo. Tenías que haberse la dado, Elena. ¿Dónde tiraste la moneda? En la presa. En la presa. Mary lunged and grabbed the steering wheel. The car plunged directly into the river. Meanwhile, the mayor hurriedly ran back to the factory to find a shovel. He dug open the spot mentioned by Hank. Sure enough, he found Mario's remains. At the same time, fake Mario crawled out of the car. He held Mary and headed towards a nearby gas station. In the back seat, Mary regained consciousness and secretly sent a text message to contact the mayor. Just then, the car stopped near the reservoir. Mario dragged Mary to the edge of the bridge. He threatened her to reveal the location of the silver coin. Mary said that the silver coin is in the water. If you want it, you can jump into the water and retrieve it yourself. Upon hearing this, Mario, along with the veterinarian, stepped outside the bridge. At that moment, the mayor and the police officer arrived. Hasta el final. The next day, Mary buried her real husband's remains. After the events of last night, Mary grew more appreciative of the mayor, but he not only had a family, but also couldn't leave this town either. 
So, Mary decided to go to Paris, and rely on her wealthy rebound admirer. Only in this way could she calm the event of Mario's sudden appearances and disappearances. Meanwhile, in France, the wealthy admirer, was dining in a high-end sushi restaurant. He specifically chose the freshest fish. It turns out Mary wasn't lying. She did throw the silver coin into the reservoir. Now, the silver coin ended up in the hands of the wealthy admirer. On the other side, Kyle was hiding in an abandoned building. Just then, Mary suddenly called. When they were about to arrange a meeting location, the person on the other end of the call mentioned Paolo, but Mary had no idea who that person was. Kyle realized that the person on the phone was Fov. He grabbed his handgun and smashed the phone. It seems that the entire city of Rome cannot escape Fov's control. Kyle immediately sets off for Syria, because Paolo mentioned that the more hardships there are, the easier it is to evade tracking. Kyle stays in Syria to help refugees, and witnesses the brutality of war. One day, a child rushes in and grabs him, leading Kyle to a car. It turns out that Father Lombardi has come to find him. He reveals that the white cloak father has gone missing, and a few days ago, someone attacked the Pope, thanks to the holy relics preserved in the church. He was protected, and the Pope survived the attack. Currently, the Roman Curia is completely under Fov's control, and the consequences would be unimaginable once he gathers all 30 silver coins. Lombardi instructs Kyle to guard the coin carefully, but the question is, how can he contact Mary, who is far away in a foreign land? Without using a phone, Kyle remembers that Fov can invade dreams, and he has at least read the Gospel of Jesus, perhaps he can do it too. Kyle injects himself with an anesthetic, and returns to the small town in his dream. Everything in the dream is strange and illogical. He eventually finds Mary in the supermarket. ¿Cómo sé que eres tú? Sé dónde está tu escondite secreto. Está en la iglesia, detrás de una virgen de madera. Si encuentras la moneda estamos perdidos. Debes defenderla con tu vida hasta que yo regrese. Yo no la tengo. Several passing ladies gather to eavesdrop, and Kyle fears they may be spies for Fov, so he tries to pull Mary away. To their surprise, the once normal supermarket transforms into a maze. Before they can figure out a way to escape, Lily appears, engaging in self-harm once again. Mary gets scared and covers her eyes. This scare causes Kyle and Lily to be expelled from the dream. Then, a red cloth appears on the ground, and Mary steps on it and moves forward. She sees Fov ahead. But luckily, it's just a scene in the dream. On the other side, a group of soldiers storms into the refugee camp and captures Kyle, who was helping people, simply because he is wearing a cross. Kyle is thrown into a dungeon by the soldiers, and he doesn't understand why he was captured. Meanwhile, the mayor is fed up with his current life, and he tells his wife Ellie that he intends to resign. Ellie tells the mayor not to act like a child, and to quickly go on stage to deliver his campaign speech. However, to everyone's surprise, the mayor reads only two lines from the script, and declares that he will resign once the deadline is reached. At this moment, a car from out of town stops in the square, and two agents from the National Security Bureau step out. They are a blonde female detective and her assistant. They have come specifically to investigate the mysterious events in the small town, and the first person the female detective wants to investigate is Hank, who shot at the police. Yet, the old police officer has already given a heads up to Hank, advising him not to say anything reckless. The incident of him accidentally killing Mario two years ago has already been covered up, so he must not cause any more trouble. Otherwise, it would be impossible to explain to people the situation of Mario's resurrection and subsequent disappearance. Hank agreed on the surface, but he couldn't comprehend the situation of Mario's resurrection, and he ended his life by shooting himself. The whole town is shrouded in gloom. After returning home, the mayor had a big fight with Ellie. He felt that their relationship was like business partners, and lacked any other connection. The mayor wants a simple happiness, and he doesn't care about career or fame. Upon hearing this, Ellie became furious. It's because she can't have children that she shifted her focus to her career, and the mayor knew this. The mayor's ramblings are just a cover-up. In reality, he has ceased to be faithful. He is planning to go to Paris to find Mary, but he is interrupted when the female detective calls him in for questioning at the police station. Meanwhile, in Paris, a familiar face appears. It is the priest affiliated with Canites, who has appeared multiple times. For convenience, let's call him the Black Priest. The Black Priest sits in front of an old man and asks how he's been. The old man stands up and stretches his muscles, saying he can beat up any strong guys, and run two miles without any problem. Upon hearing this, the Black Priest hands him a necklace. Once the old man puts on the necklace, he becomes a puppet. He punches down a caregiver and follows the Black Priest out. At this moment, 
Mary is dining in a restaurant nearby. The rich guy says, I have a gift for you, and Mary thinks he is going to propose. She excuses herself to the restroom to contact the mayor. Meanwhile, the old man wearing the necklace has arrived at the restaurant. The customers see him holding a gun and quickly flee. Mary hides in the shadows and observes. She sees the old man rummaging around the rich guy, and the small box containing the silver coin is under the tablecloth. Just as the old man is about to take the silver coin, a security guard rushes in and fires a shot. In the struggle, he snatches the necklace from the old man, who immediately loses control and falls to the ground, dead. In this way, the silver coin ends up back in Mary's hands. The mayor also learns about the rich guy's tragic death. Ellie doesn't wait for her husband's apology, but finds out from a neighbor that the mayor has rented a room in a bar. That night, the cries of a young beggar break the silence. The female detective and her assistant block him, and ask what he's shouting. The beggar replies that a new priest is coming to town. The female detective realizes that the young beggar has an intellectual disability. They were ready to extract information from him. The young beggar had no filter on his mouth, and blurted out everything including stories about a cow giving birth to a child, mirror people, and resurrecting scarecrow. After listening, the female detective and her partner secretly thought that this young man was indeed mentally ill. Just as they were about to leave, the female detective suddenly pointed to the main road. Surprisingly, a new priest had actually arrived in town. Wasn't this the warehouse demon? Ellie thought it was the result of the townspeople's petition. So they sent a priest, replacing Kyle. That's why they invited the demon to stay at the hotel. The female detective noticed black. Foul-smelling slime left behind by the demon's footsteps. She temporarily set aside this clue. When she received a tip-off about a veterinarian secretly hiding a corpse, the female detective and her assistant opened Mary's husband's grave, preparing to take the remains back for analysis. On the other side, Kyle was grabbed by the head and dragged out of the dungeon. A car was taking prisoners to the desert for execution. Perhaps it was indeed by the grace of God. A compassionate local soldier didn't want to kill the innocent, and secretly released Kyle, and the other two, prisoners, in the same car. The three of them seized an abandoned car, and prepared to escape the desert. Unexpectedly, a soldier chased after them, broke the window, and engaged in a fight with Kyle inside the car. This old beat-up car couldn't withstand all the commotion. It flipped over after not going far, and everyone quickly got out and escaped. The soldier rushed forward and tackled Kyle, but unexpectedly, the next moment, Kyle fought back and killed the soldier. Kyle had two, holy marks, left on his hand. The scene shifted back to the small town. Ellie was about to talk to the mayor about getting a divorce. In order to embrace a new phase of her life, she cut off her long hair. During the discussion of property division between the two parties, the mayor gave up all his assets and shares. He just wanted to quickly escape from this marriage. On the other side, the demon found the old woman who controlled the scarecrow and handed her a packet of powder. The old woman poured the powder into the town sewage system, unaware that the young beggar was witnessing everything. Shortly after, Ellie personally came and gave the demon the key to the church. The demon, seeing her eyes red from crying due to the divorce, handed her a card and instructed her to hide it on the mayor. Meanwhile, the test report on Mario's remains was out. The female detective called the old police officer for a conversation. The victim's skull had a bullet embedded in it. As a police officer, don't you need to explain the situation? The old police officer slammed the table in response to the words and said, I can't even understand it myself. How can I explain it to you? Mario was mistakenly killed two years ago, and recently he suddenly came back to life. Unfortunately, he jumped into a reservoir and was shattered into pieces in midair. That's the explanation you wanted. The old police officer told the female detective that this town is cursed, and she has no idea what she's gotten herself into. He advised her to leave while she still can. The female detective believed that the police officer was not cooperating with her work, so she locked him up in the detention room. Late that night, the old woman sneaked into the slaughterhouse. She killed an employee with an iron hook, and left with a whole truckload of pig heads. Meanwhile, the town's sewer was bubbling, and emitting white smoke. Ellie bypassed the sewer and entered the bar. She pretended to deliver laundry for washing and inquired about her husband's room from the receptionist. Then she hid the card in the mayor's pocket. Immediately after leaving the bar, the smoke from the saw became even thicker. Ellie could only call her husband to handle the situation. After all, he was still the mayor, and he couldn't ignore the problems in the town. The mayor realized there was a problem as soon as he saw the smoke. He decided not to continue hiding the recent strange events from the townspeople, and decided to hold a meeting. The mayor went back to his room to make a phone call, and inform Mary, then put on his coat and prepared to leave. Meanwhile, the young beggar was tracking the demon. 
who kept pouring black slime onto the ground. Curious, the beggar asked the demon what it was doing, and if it was helping to exterminate rats. He believed that there was no reason not to take the advantage of the fool. The demon handed all the slime to the young beggar, and instructed him to walk around the town in a circle. After giving these instructions, the demon went to interrupt the villagers' meeting. It easily controlled the mayor through that card, and stood before the crowd to brainwash them. Unexpectedly, the young beggar suddenly rushed in, and told everyone that the priest was actually a demon in disguise. He explained that, the person intentionally created the thick fog, to prevent them from seeing the black lines on the ground. The townspeople burst into laughter after hearing this, as no one believed the beggar's words. The female detective and her assistant left the meeting early. Just a few meters outside, they saw a door with a pig's head hanging on it, and the figure of the old woman flashed by in the fog. Witnessing this, the detective and her assistant began to believe the words of the old police officer. Perhaps this town is truly extraordinary. At this moment, a little girl was playing with a ball in the thick fog. She noticed that no matter how hard she tried, the ball couldn't pass through the wide open gate. It was as if the town was sealed off by an invisible barrier. It was likely that the demon drew those black lines to prevent the townspeople from escaping. The scene shifts to the mayor's side. He had a persistent fever due to the card, and Ellie by his side was also influenced by the demon. This situation brought internal and external troubles. Fortunately, Mary came back the next morning, carrying the last silver coin. The thick fog in the town had not dissipated yet, and most of the townspeople were hiding in the church, afraid to go outside. Only an old man came in angrily, holding a pig's head. He questioned everyone, who hung this thing on my doorstep? As soon as he finished speaking, another man threw a pig's head. It seemed that this situation was not an isolated incident. Amidst the chaos, Mary arrived at the entrance of the small town. She reached out and touched the thick fog. Immediately, the demon, Fov, and others felt the power of the silver coin. The next second, the town's barrier opened up to Mary. The old woman who was guarding the entrance pretended to collapse on the ground and started acting pitiful. Mary immediately helped her up, and the two of them walked towards the vicinity of the bar. The old woman complained that she couldn't walk anymore. She urged Mary to go into the bar immediately, saying that someone was waiting for her in the first room on the left. Mary rushed in and saw the mayor lying on the ground, barely clinging to life. At the same time, the old police officer couldn't remain calm any longer. He smashed the door of the detention room, and stole a police car in an attempt to escape. The female detective and her assistant quickly caught up, and the two cars raced towards the gate, one in front of the other. Desperate villagers climbed up the bell tower to assess the situation, only to discover that there was no fog outside the town. Just then, a car drove towards the town, and it turned out to be Kyle who had returned. He easily walked into the town's barrier. At the same time, the demon told Ellie that she could escape from the sacristy later. After saying that, the demon left the church and locked the door. The townspeople hurriedly rushed forward and slammed into the door. Ellie took the opportunity to slip into the sacristy and climb out through the window. Meanwhile, the demon threw a cigarette but into the window, igniting the holy garments. The church was about to be engulfed in flames. At this moment, Ellie went to the bar to save the mayor. But when she opened the door, she saw Mary. Ellie, who received guidance from the demon, had become stronger in combat. The mayor tried to help but accidentally fell off the bed, and a card fell out of his clothes. Meanwhile, Ellie and the veterinarian tumbled down the stairs. Ellie grabbed the other person's head and struck it fiercely, then snatched Mary's silver coin necklace. The mayor quickly approached and pushed Ellie away, demanding that she hand over the silver coin. <laughs> Ellie handed the silver coin to the demon. On the other side, the townspeople finally managed to break open the door and fled from the burning church. They became lost in the thick fog, unable to find their way or exit. Meanwhile, Kyle arrived at the secret room in the church and opened his own arsenal of weapons. Kyle walked out of the fire with his equipment and casually threw a black bag to the mayor and Mary, instructing them to take the weapons and save the town together. Little did they know, the next moment the demon appeared from the thick fog, its eerie smile flickering. Humans were so insignificant in the face of absolute power. Kyle was no match for the demon. The mayor and Mary hurriedly helped him into the cellar, and since the demon couldn't find them, it had to retract the thick fog. The town returned to its previous calmness. It was as if the previous incident had never occurred, but if one observed carefully, they would notice that the town's residents were like walking corpses. One day, a group of Japanese tourists came to visit. They noticed the eerie silence in the entire town. The next moment, several locals suddenly appeared. 
and rushed towards the tourists. The mayor, who was hiding on the roof, witnessed this scene and quickly returned to the cellar to inform Mary. It turned out that the three of them had been hiding underground for 15 days. During this time, Kyle discovered the origin of the black thread. It was made from the blood of unborn fetuses, and belonged to a very ancient spell. Kyle is drilling a hole in the wall of the church to find a way out. He needs the mayor's help to gather two things. The first is the blood of St. Ambrose hidden in the church, and the second is the map of the entire cellar. To help Kyle find these two things, the mayor sneaks into the church under the cover of darkness. At this moment, the demon has taken over the church, and is actually preaching in the guise of a priest. He even distributes the Holy Communion to Japanese tourists. Anyone who consumes it will be under the control of the demon. Among the townspeople who receive the Holy Communion with their mouths, only Ellie chooses to receive it with her hands. Could it be that she is not under the control of the demon? Taking advantage of the situation, the mayor takes the blood of St. Ambrose, and then goes to the town hall to find Mary, and search for the map of the cellar. Unexpectedly, the two of them run into trouble. The mayor knocks out the staff with the butt of his gun, while Mary threatens the staff's accomplice to hand over the map. They then hand over the two items to Kyle. He smashes the glass bottle, and applies the blood of St. Ambrose to his own eyes, and those of a carrier pigeon. This way, Kyle can share the pigeon's vision. Unfortunately, the little carrier pigeon is discovered by the demon's puppet shortly after it flies out. That night, the mayor goes out again to investigate, and sees several black cars entering the town, apparently transporting some goods. The mayor is confused, and plans to go to Ellie's place to gather information. To his surprise, Ellie really didn't consume the Holy Communion and remained sober. It's rare for two people to sit down and have dinner together. The mayor wants Ellie to leave with him, but she doesn't want to see Mary. They have an argument and part ways. Once the mayor leaves, Ellie takes the toast which was bitten by the mayor, to find the old woman to perform witchcraft. The woman dips her finger into some jam, and tastes the flavor of the mayor and the veterinarian's saliva. Ellie is heartbroken upon hearing this. The old woman wipes away the tears from Ellie's eyes, and prepares a bottle of magical potion. She dips a silver needle into the liquid, and attaches it to Ellie's clothes. It's unclear what these two are up to, but Kyle and the veterinarian enter the tunnel they dug. They plan to go to the castle to find the silver coin. The mayor quickly arrives to regroup. On the other side, the old police officer and the young beggar are not under the demon's influence, but the old police officer is locked up in a detention room. The young beggar uses a trick to distract the female detectives and her assistant, and manages to rescue the old police officer. However, he soon revealed a shocking news. The person the young beggar mentioned should be Fov, who will come to the town to take the 30th silver coin. The young beggar tells the old police officer that Napoleon once used three coins to do evil deeds, and even the infamous Hitler only obtained five silver coins. Just imagine what earth-shattering action Fov would take after collecting all 30 silver coins. The scene shifts back to the cellar, where Kyle, who was exploring ahead, falls into a trap. Mary quickly rushes to help, while the mayor continues to explore ahead. To his surprise, the mayor catches a glimpse of Ellie's figure. He quickly tells Mary about it, and she becomes furious upon hearing the news. Didn't I tell you to stay away from that woman? <laughs> She pulls out a silver needle and stabs the veterinarian, then takes the opportunity to leave the cellar. After failing to wake Mary up, the mayor hurriedly goes to seek Kyle's help. However, when the two of them return to the original location, Mary has already disappeared. The next day, a grand convoy arrives in the town, with Fauve and several followers appearing. He warmly embraces the demons, and their grand plan is about to be completed. The town is filled with animal corpses, the walls are covered in symbols drawn with fresh blood, and buzzing flies fill every corner. All the signs indicate that something significant is going to happen today. At this moment, Kyle and the mayor sneak into the hotel. The two of them found Mary unconscious and unresponsive. Just then, Fov and the demons passed by, with Kyle quietly following the two of them. The mayor was about to chase after them, but the mayor noticed a mysterious old woman suddenly appearing. She told the mayor that if he wanted to wake Mary up, he just needed to remove the silver needle. The mayor, without any suspicion, removed the silver needle. However, to his surprise, Mary suddenly started to bleed uncontrollably, and the old woman beside her kept laughing wickedly. Enraged, the mayor rushed over and violently attacked her, but to his astonishment, the old woman grew several spider legs. On the other side, Kyle opened a door, and saw the walls covered with animal skulls. The Canites killed these Easter sacrificial animals as a blessing for this ceremony. Meanwhile, Fauve was bathing and changing clothes ahead, putting on a robe stained with animal blood. A demon came to stop Kyle from interfering, and confessed a secret. 
It was the same demon that possessed Shiakomo in the beginning. The demon intentionally gave the silver coin to Kyle, making him unwittingly become the guardian of the coins. Just as Jesus' birth required Judah's betrayal, Fod's ascension also required the sacrifice of a saint. From the beginning, Kyle was part of their plan. At this moment, Fov was fully dressed, with the final silver coin embedded in his crown. He held the, the Spear of Longinus, which once pierced Christ, and deeply stabbed it into Kyle's chest. After completing all the preparations, Fov pushed open the window and walked towards the balcony. He was about to become the new Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. Meanwhile, the mayor, along with Mary, was preparing to escape but was unexpectedly blocked by the female detective and her assistant. Without hesitation, the mayor shot, and injured both of them before fleeing the town with Mary. The pigeon in the arms of the young beggar flapped its wings, ready to fly. It broke free from its restraints and soared into the sky. Kyle sensed the pigeon's perspective and took control, directing it towards Fov. Then, Kyle gritted his teeth and pulled out the spear of Longinus. With a loud shout, he charged forward holding Favia and falling down the building. The silver coins on the crown scattered on the ground. The followers, like hungry hyenas spotting decaying meat, rushed forward to grab the silver coins. One of the coins rolled to Ellie's feet, and she picked it up and followed the black priest as they left. Afterwards, the followers scattered with the silver coins, leaving the bodies of Kyle and Fov on the ground. Seeing the situation, the demon had to change its appearance, and entered the world inside the mirror. The story of the first season comes to an end. The pacing is tight and engaging. The opening alone sets the tone for the entire series, blending religious elements with horror and suspense. It revolves around the story of the 30 silver coins, and each subplot is well crafted. The special effects and plot are solid, although it may become a bit sluggish in the latter half. However, overall, the flaws are minor compared to its merits. It's definitely worth watching.